Right, let me, having dealt with public spending like that, let me turn to Scottish independence. Now, I would assume that Alex Salmon's hit squad, as they come and try and disrupt the meeting, will come in uh, round about now. So keep your eyes open. Um, I've been asked more questions about Scottish independence in recent years than any other subject except the Euro. And uh, I think just about every second lecture there's been a question. I don't think I've dealt with them satisfactorily. So uh, what I'd like to do is try to deal with them this time. Here's a picture of their great leader, the Scottish version of Robert Mugabe. Um, as a Scot who's intensely proud to be British, I'm amazed that my fellow countrymen have any desire to be independent. Certainly the examples of the two areas where Scotland already has independence, which are the Scottish football team and the Scottish rugby team, are not encouraging, to put it mildly. Though the Scottish football team have bounced back in world rankings to number 22, their typical ranking is about 40, and they have dropped as low as 86 in recent years. The Scottish rugby team is the 10th ranked in the world, comfortably behind any of the other home nations. They're below Samoa, but just above Fiji and Tonga. But I think on the issue of Scottish independence, it's Tony Blair who sold the pass. I'm sure he hoped that Scottish home rule would be a destination in itself. But anyone with a working knowledge of history could see that this would only work while the same party controlled both the Scottish Parliament and the Westminster Parliament. And you really couldn't rely on that existing forever. Now, as someone with a family home in Scotland who visits reg regularly, it's hard not to notice that the Scottish media behaves as if Scotland were independent already. Um, pretty well all the attention is to what's happening in Scotland. There's remarkably little coverage of the rest of the UK in the Scottish media today. And I think that is a change that has happened since devolution. But I think there is actually a historic separation between uh, Scotland and England. There's remarkably little population uh, north of Newcastle going out to Edinburgh. My parents have a house in East Lothian, and I've walked 20 miles south without seeing any human habitation at all. Uh, there's a big sort of wasteland in between. Of course, if you walk 20 miles south, there's no mobile phone system, signal either, which is normally the proof of underpopulation, because where there's population, uh, the telephone companies make sure there's a mast. Um, Scotland's had a traditionally collectivist culture. And actually, for most of the past 400 years, it's worked very well, right up to the 1960s. Someone who had obtained a number of hires in the school exams in Scotland could expect to be rather better educated than someone with a degree from one of the lesser English universities. And that was even before they suddenly called all the polytechnics universities and you know, started issuing degrees in media studies and the like. Um, let alone uh, you know, a, a, a pop theory and that kind of stuff. Um, the Scottish education system was the envy of the world and contributed to the Scots' genius for invention that prepared the way for so much of the modern world. I'd like to make three propositions. First, whether we like it or not, Scottish independence looks very likely. I think the only circumstances the in which I would see it not happening at all is if there is a very large no majority on the 18th of September this year. In many ways, a small no vote is the worst of all worlds because it keeps the ball in play. And uncertainty is the thing that really is economically damaging. A small no vote would mean, unless SNP, the SNP lose, lost power, that they would keep holding referenda until they either got a yes or the no vote climbed. And I think the momentum would tend to be with them. My second proposition is that the initial economic costs are probably a lot higher than most people imagine. Um, Scotland actually pays its own way as far as the budget deficit is concerned, although they'd have to have a slightly tighter one, being a small economy if they were independent. Uh, Scotland's got two things. It's got North Sea oil, uh, but it's also got, and this is a tragic thing to say, and you shouldn't say it and make too much of a joke about it, but it is paradoxical. Uh, because life expectancy in parts of Scotland is so low, they make a huge saving on their pension bill and on their social security costs. 
And that was the big hole in Gordon Brown's argument last week. That's why his numbers actually were completely wrong. Um, that is a benefit to the Scottish economy in fiscal terms, nearly as big as that of North Sea Oil, surprisingly. But it is paradoxical, and I wouldn't want to make too much of a joke about it. Um, now, there are some industries in Scotland that would be boosted by independence. I think tourism probably would be. Uh, but the one that I think is particularly at risk is financial services. Financial services, are unlike, uh, and particularly banks, um, do actually have to be regulated within uh, the same area as their customers. And I think the banking crises that we've seen now make it pretty clear that that has to be the case. And the weaknesses of the euro mean that I cannot see any chance of either an economic union or a banking union with an independent country. It just won't happen. And you know, Whitehall is scarred by this. So this is you know, the collective wisdom of Whitehall is so totally again that whatever anyone says, it just won't happen. But without a banking union, I think that probably between 20 and 40,000 jobs, and it's obviously difficult to be precise about this, uh, are potentially at risk, as banks particularly, but quite a lot of the other fund management firms, except those who are specialists, um, move jobs to London, and particularly to the city of London. My third proposition is that many Scots seem to think that they're voting not so much for independence, but from the rest of the UK, but for independence from the laws of economics, which they seem to think have been imposed upon them by the English. Now, unfortunately, for those who think this, the laws of economics are not actually subject to referenda and will continue to exist beyond Scottish independence if and when it occurs. And my sort of suspicion is that an independent Scotland may learn about economics the hard way. There could well be an initial slump uh, as you get the knock-on effect, first of all, from some fiscal adjustments, secondly, from the cost of having to pay for all the parties and all the embassies and all the other things that uh, you know, presidents and things like to have or new leaders like to have. You know, basically, these people are slightly trumped-up town councillors who are going to be on a spending spree and given a country. So they will be uh, living it up a bit initially. Also, the rest of the UK has been treated pretty roughly by the pro-independence campaign, and I suspect will be in no mood to be especially generous in divorce of them. Post-independence, there might be also an initial period of tax and spend with its normal negative implications for economic growth. But that's the initial effect. I do think they'd learn, and I think at some point there would be a growth spurt. It took Ireland 40 years uh, to get its economy right after independence. Um, I don't think it would take as long in Scotland. Uh, it cost Ireland, my rough guess, is about 30% of GDP while they pursued slightly muddled economic policies as a result of independence. Again, I don't think it would cost as much in Scotland. I think it might only be 10% or so. But still, that's a cost. However, if you're in favour of Scottish independence, then I guess you'd be prepared to spend 10p in the pound to get it. Economics is not the only thing in life. And you have to balance economic considerations with other considerations. Now, I have a final point, which I haven't really got time to labour properly. So I'll just leave it as an observation. Um, Scottish independence will affect the rest of us in the UK much more than we imagine. There's no doubt Scotland is a viable economy independently, but I don't think Wales is. Scotland and Wales both got home rule at the same time. I think the Welsh are going to be left incredibly lonely if Scotland gets independence. And I really see no prospect of Welsh independence. I don't think Wales could survive economically with independence. The scale of subsidy from the rest of the UK to Wales is, is pretty massive. Um, England will also look different. The extent to which the north of England is dominated by the affluent south will get much greater. And without Scotland, the rest of the country will probably move to the right politically, which some people may think is a good thing, although uh, others may not. At the same time, we should remember that the rest of the UK, um, and hopefully someone will think of a better name, by the way, um, has a GDP that will still be 92% of the GDP, including Scotland. And even without Scotland, 
the rest of the country's GDP will overtake France by about 2016 and would probably overtake Germany by about 2040 uh, if the euro remains weak. So, I mean, yes, the rest would be affected, but actually most of it does remain and uh, will have quite an incentive for economic prosperity. <laughs>